Hello, everyone, and welcome to the professional VMware.com V Brown Bag. Tonight, we are going to be covering the Cisco CCNA DC exam. Well, this is actually the second part uh, or the second exam uh, for this certification, 64916. And we'll be talking about DC fundamentals with Shane Walton. Shane, how are you tonight? I'm doing fine. Thank you for having me again. Yeah, thanks for coming on again. We really appreciate it. Uh, a few quick show notes. You want to ask a question or just join in on the conversation? Maybe you've got something to share. You can hit us up uh, at v brown bag or use the v brown bag hashtag. Uh, we've got a couple other show shows. Our APAC show, which Brett Johnson's been doing a uh, great job uh, rounding folks up for. They just did uh, log insight and Roomcast. Uh, that's running every other week. We've got our Amia shows that are currently doing uh, VCP. Uh, Envy, I think they actually might have moved over to cloud now, and they're also covering some of the Cisco shows. Our Latin America show, which uh, for our Spanish-speaking audience, at on Thursdays. And, of course, our U.S. show here, Wednesdays, 7.30 p.m. Central Time. Our guest tonight, again, is Shane Walton. You can follow him on Twitter at Shane underscore Walton. And I am your host for the evening, Jonathan Frappier. So if you've got any questions, uh, feel free to uh, drop a note on Twitter or in the GoToWebinar uh, question window, and I will get those to Shane uh, when we can squeeze them in. With that, I'm going to make you the presenter. All right. You should have that now. Yep. All right. Can you see my screen? I can, yep. Great. All right. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. And thank you for having me back for the second part of the Cisco Data Center Fundamentals Concepts. Uh, my name is Shane Walton, and I'm a data center solutions engineer. Today, our agenda is to go over some more of the 64916 Introducing Cisco Data Center Technologies path for the certification of the CCNA Data Center. Today, we're going to describe Fabric Path. We are going to describe, configure, and verify VPC and VDC. We're going to identify key differentiators between the data center interconnect and network interconnectivity. Then we're going to end with describing and configuring Nexus products. Okay, this again, this is 64916, Introducing Cisco Data Center Technology. It is the second test in the CCNA data center track. Most of the content that's being used here today is coming from the official CERT guide, which is the CCNA Data Center, DCICT 64916. Uh, it is a third, in its third printing of September 2015. This is the most recent book for the certification, and the ISBN numbers are on the screen in case you want to make sure that you're getting the correct one. Uh, it can be purchased individually or as part of the official CERT guide library, which is what I've done. Okay. Introducing Cisco Data Center technologies comprises of six distinct areas, the Cisco Data Center Fundamental Concept, which is 30% of the exam. Uh, that's what we're going over today, at least the second part. Uh, last week, we went over the first part. Uh, Cisco Data Center Unified Fabric it accounts for 20% of the exam. I will be going over that with you next week as well on Wednesday. Uh, then somebody else will be taking over storage networking, which is worth 18% of the exam. Uh, data Center Virtualization for 14% for of the exam. Unified Computing at 17%. 17% of the exam, and then finally, data center network service is a very small part of the exam, but there are still some services like uh, load balancing and uh, firewall that you can, you're can you going to have some questions on. Okay, first section is to describe fiber path, fabric path. So fabric path is a simplified and scalable layer to fabric, where normally you have uh, multiple spanning tree links going everywhere and having to deal with spanning tree or some other mechanism to avoid spanning tree, Fabric Path lets you build them all into one single unified fabric. It combines the benefits of Layer 3 routing with the advantage of Layer 2 switching. Uh, it brings stability and performance of Layer 3 routing to a Layer 2 switch network. Uh, you can build highly resilient, massively scalable, and flexible Layer 2 fabrics. The underpinning is intermediate system to intermediate system protocol, which is normally a Layer 3 technology, but it's being used as layer for layer, layer 2 for Layer 2 switching. And there is no need to run SDP. All of the links will be active all the time. It's one unified fabric, and so you can have full mobility of your, da your data center aspects. So whether you're doing V motions or you're moving hosts from, hosts from one side to another, as long as they're in the same Layer 2 consistency group, 
they're going to be able to move anywhere within the fabric and, and talk to any other device within the same fabric. And it can be deployed in any topology, but it's going to be it usually found in a spine and leaf in the data center. So some of the benefits of it are it's operationally extremely simple to use. It's simple to configure. It's easy to, oper easy to operate. Uh, the switch control plane for Fabric Path, it'll start automatically once the feature is enabled and you assign ports to the Fabric Path network. There's no additional configuration that you have to do. Uh, it's such a small footprint from a configuration standpoint that it's actually less than configuring stand, spanning tree protocol on a conventional layer two network. Uh, it uses a single protocol for unicast, multicast forwarding and VLAN pruning. It's very flexible. It's a single layer two domain fabric that connects to all the servers. Since all your servers are going to reside in a single common layer two network, they can be moved throughout the data center without disrupting anything. So your vMotions, uh, changing physical servers from one switch to another in the case of a failure, uh, they can all be pinned back into the network in the same layer two network without any disruption. Uh, it's extremely high performance. It uses all the ex fabric path, uses all the available paths in the network rather than having to go through the the uh, control plane protocol like spanning tree to determine which is the best path and which are redundant paths for end, end loop avoidance. Uh, it won't shut down any ports. It'll use all of those ports. It uses the ISIS as a control plane mechanism, which has been around for a very long time. It's highly reliable. It's extremely scalable and has nothing. It has high availability. It delivers highly scalable bandwidth. You can actually increase the bandwidth on the fly. So as you add more links to the fa to the fabric, it, you can just completely increase the amount of bandwidth you need as your data center grows. And it's very efficient. It learns MAC addresses selectively at the edge. So rather than having these large networks that have a whole lot of MAC address tape tables and the size of the MAC address tables get to the point where uh, you're having an impact with your uh, network switches or you have to do upgrades. It selectively learns them at the edge and has much more scalable layer two forwarding tables. The components of Fabric Path, this network, this, this diagram shows all of the individual components. It has the spine switches, which is in a two-tier architecture. They deploy to broad connectivity between the leaf switches. They act as the backbone of the switching fabric. The leaf switches are the access layer connectivity for servers and other access layer devices. Uh, the hosts on those leaf switches use a spine switch to communicate with each other. So host A communicates with host B through the spine. The fabric path network, which is the cloud in the middle, is the network that connects all the fabric path switches to the fabric path network. In the data center, Fabric Path is built using the spline and topology, and this Fabric Path network packets are forwarded based on the new header, which is added to the existing regular Ethernet header, and it includes switch ID and hop count. Uh, the Fabric Path header is added to the Layer 2 packet when the packet enters the Fabric Path network at the ingress switch, and it's stripped when it leaves the Fabric Path network at the egress switch. The cloud on the bottom, the classical Ethernet network, is standard layer two Ethernet that you're used to. It uh, uses bridging and it runs spanning tree protocol. It's referred to as classical Ethernet because of that. Uh, the Nexus switches, they can be part of both a fabric path network and a classical Ethernet network at the same time. Uh, it'll have the edge ports that are going down to the hosts and it'll use the core ports for fabric path. The core ports are the ports in the fabric path network that point into the fabric path network itself, uh, the edge ports are connected down to the classical Ethernet. And they behave like normal Ethernet ports, and you can connect any device, or whether it's a host or a switch to the classical Ethernet ports. And since they're part of the classical Ethernet, MAC address learning is performed in the normal manner. As they, as they pass through the switch, they get added to the MAC address table, and that's where it's learned. And you can configure the uh, edge port as an access port or as an 82.12 trunk port. Fabric path VLANs are VLANs that are only going to be transported across the fabric path network. By default, it's going to operate in classical Ethernet mode, but if you allow a VLAN over the fabric path, you have to actually go into the VLAN configuration and change the mode to fabric path. If you have an edge port, it can carry both a classical Ethernet as well as a fabric path VLAN, so they can communicate with each other. The fabric path ISIS is the fabric path which is they run a shortest pass first algorithm routing protocol based on the standard ISIS to build the forwarding table similar to you would in any layer three network. 
It's a link state protocol and it's the core of the fabric path control plane. Fabric Path uses dynamic resource allocation protocol. It's an extension to the Fabric Path IS Assist that shows that the network and ID network wide, the switch IDs and the F tag values are, are consistent. And we'll get into what those are in the next slide or two. Uh, the switch table provides layer two routing information based on switch ID. Uh, in a Fabric Path network, and rather than using the egress port that the MAC address was learned on, uh, it now uses the switch ID through the fabric path network so it can forward it through the tree towards that switch. Uh, the MAC address table is where the MAC address entries and the sources from where the MAC addresses are learned, whether it's a local switch interface or if it's a remote switch. The MAC address if it has a table in the local switch interface, the packet's delivered using classical Ethernet format. If it's pointing to a remote switch, a lookup's done on the switch to find the next hop interface and then it gets encapsulated across in the fabric path header and sent to the next hop of the fabric path network. The fabric path topology, it's very similar to standard spanning tree protocol where a set of VLANs can belong to one or a different instance. In a fabric path, a set of VLANs that have the same forwarding behavior or will be mapped to a, topo mapped to a topology or a forwarding instance and different topologies can be constructed for different sets of VLANs. So uh, you might have a, an, a forwarding tag for a topology that's in a multi-destinational tree that's uh, actually builds out two distinct topologies and the different VLANs can belong to each of those topologies. And you can use that for traffic engineering, administrative purposes, or security. The Fabric Path frame format, it's a classical Ethernet frame that is encapsulated with a 16-byte Fabric Path header. Uh, the Fabric Path header has an outer MAC destination address, which includes a 48-bit address space with a 12-bit unique switch ID. Uh, the outer MAC source address is also a 48-bit address space with a 12-bit unique source switch ID. And a fabric path tag, it's a 32-bit with a new ether type forwarding tag and, and a time to live. Just like any other packet, it tracks time to live so that as it passes through the different devices, it gets decremented uh, in case for some reason there is a loop, which shouldn't happen, but in the case that it does, it can actually forward, fall down to zero and then be discarded. The Fabric Pass con control plane, it uses a single control plane that functions for unicast, broadcast, and multicast pack pa packets. It leverages layer two intermediate system to system protocol. Uh, you, again, you don't need to run any spanning tree protocol within the Fabric Path network. The uh, ISI, the layer two ISS is a completely separate process from layer three ISS, and the Fabric Path IS provides some of the following benefits. It's uses, it does, it performs switch ID allocation, and it will, Use fabric path switches will establish an IS IS adjacency to the directly connected neighboring switches on the core ports. Uh, they then start negotiating a process that ensures that all the fabric path switches have unique switch ID. You can manually provide a switch ID, but it, if you don't provide manual switch IDs, it has a protocol that will go ahead and work out switch IDs so that they don't have unique. They all have unique switch IDs across the network. It's extensible. The ISIS devices they use custom type, length, and value settings (TLD), mm -hmm. so they can be ex they can be extended by third parties if they need to. Uh, it provides shortest path first routing, and again, ISIS protocol functions perform switch ID allocation, and it handles unicast routing and multi-destinational trees. Multi-destinational trees are up to two logical trees through the network and those are handled by ISIS, it will always generate at least two separate topologies in the network for getting from point A to point B through the network without any loops. And they're identified by fabric tags, and those topologies can be used for traffic, engineering, security. You can put different traffic on, and different VLANs on different F tags. The layer two packets forward through the fabric pack path network are some of the following types, and this is part of the data plane. Data plane is going to be any of the user-based uh, traffic flow, whether it's a server to server, a workstation to server, or a workstation to workstation. Uh, it's the data that runs across the network. The control plane is the data that keeps the information that allows the data plane to move through the network, uh, whether it's uh, routing protocols, layer two, that MAC table information, but the data plane is where all of the normal traffic for the user traffic, so traffic goes through. Uh, and those are multi, one of the three three or four filing types. They do a known unicast packet, which is 
done based on mapping between a Unicast MAC address and the switch ID that's already been learned by the network. Since it's already been learned by the network, it's considered known. Uh, a multicast packet where multicast forwarding is done based on a multi destinational tree. So if you have a multicast application and you, it's going to go across multiple to multiple devices, it'll use one or both trees to send copies of itself throughout the network rather than and it can also look into IGMP snooping and use IGMP to prune parts of the multi-destinational tree out so it doesn't send traffic unnecessarily to switches that don't have people joined into the multicast group that it's being forwarded. Uh, then there's broadcast and unknown unicast. Uh, those are done based on a multi-destinational tree as well mm -hmm. by ISS for each of the topologies so they can, they can use both topologies as well. So Fabric Path has uh, several switch roles in unicast forwarding. One is the ingress fabric switch. Uh, it will receive a classical Ethernet frame from a Fabric Path edge port. So that's going to be where the host or maybe another classical Ethernet switch is connected to. It will perform a MAC table lookup to identify the Fabric Path switch ID. Uh, it performs a switch ID table lookup to determine the next hop for the Fabric Path interface. And then it will encapsulate it in Fabric Path header and send it to the core port for which the next hop fabric path switch exists. The core fabric path switch in turn will receive the fabric path encapsulated frame on a fabric core port. It'll perform a switch ID table lookup to determine the next hop interface for fabric path. It'll decrement the TTL and send the frame to the core port for the next hop in the switch. Eventually it's going to end up in the egress fabric path switch where it will receive the fabric path encapsulated frame on the fabric core port. It'll perform another switch ID table lookup to determine whether the egress fabric path it is the egress fabric path switch. It'll use a local ID value in the outer destination address or a MAC address table lookup to determine which fabric path edge port the frame should be forwarded to. And then it'll forward it to the frame. So from a host A to host B perspective, it'll go through an edge port. It'll be forwarded from the core port to one of the other fabric path switches and it'll go down the line to the multi-destinational tree and whichever F tag it happened to be put on until it reaches the egress switch on a core port and then it'll be decapsulated It'll do a normal classical Ethernet lookup and then it'll forward it to the appropriate port for host B. Uh, Fabric Path uses a concept called conversational learning, and it's one of the uh, reasons why it's, it's highly scalable. It doesn't learn, flood all of the MAC addresses, it'll actually learn them selectively. So it, it allows for a significant reduction in the size of the MAC address tables. So the rules for Fabric Path VLANs being learned are only Fabric Path Ed switches populate the MAC table and use the MAC table lookups to forward frames. Uh, for Ethernet frames received from a directly connected access or trunk port, the switch unconditionally learns the source MAC address as a local MAC entry. That's going to be one of the edge ports, and it's going to behave just like classical Ethernet. It's going to put it into the local MAC entry, so it's going to be there for, for as long as the aging timer lasts. Uh, for unicast frames received with Fabric Pass encapsulation, the switch will learn the source MAC address of the fr frame as a remote MAC entry only if the destination MAC address has already been learned by a local MAC entry. So what this does is it ensures that only if there are conversations going on will it allow the MAC address to be added to the table. So uh, as it, MAC addresses age out and the, the tables can fluctuate from, you know, however many entries up and down based on conversations. So they never actually collect in, in, into large tables where they have to know every MAC address on the fabric at the same time. Uh, broadcast frames don't trigger learning on the edge switches, uh, but they do update existing MAC entries that are already in the table. So uh, if a broadcast comes through with a specific source address across an ingress port, normally in classical Ethernet, that would be entered in the MAC table because it would see that uh, this MAC address source is coming through this ingress port, so it must belong to this port, and I have to send it out that port. Uh, broadcast for Fabric Path don't trigger that learning on the edge switches, uh, but if the MAC address is already in the table, broadcast will update the aging timer to make sure that they stay in there for as long as they need to. Uh, Multi-class frames trigger learning on Fabric Path switches, both edge and port. Okay, so known unicast packet flow. This is a picture of a unicast packet flow for where some of the MAC addresses have already been learned. So here we have host B trying to send a, send a packet to host A. 
It's connected to switch 15 on port 1-2. It's known as unicast because all the tables have been updated. They've been having a conversation, so the tables have the MAC addresses and, and the switch IDs and the core port interfaces in the tables. So switch 15 will then perform MAC address lookup and finds a hit pointing towards switch 10. And it forwards that over to switch 15. Switch 15 performs a switch ID lookup and selects fabric path as a core port to send the packet. So it'll send it out L1 or L2. Uh, the packet gets encapsulated with a fabric path header with S15, switch 15 in the, o in the originating source address and switch 10 in the originating destination address. The packet will traverse the packet, the fabric path network to reach the destination switch, which is switch 10. The packet will be received by switch 10 and the MAC address of host B is learned by switch 10. Uh, the MAC address is learned on fabric path and the switch ID in the originating source address is switch 15. The MAC address table in switch 10 shows the host B pointing at switch 15. Uh, then step five, switch 10 will perform a MAC address lookup table for host A and it'll see that the pack that is it's on port one one and it'll deliver the packet on port one one to host A. Fabric inter yeah, fabric path interaction with spanning tree. Fabric path can actually interact with classical Ethernet and spanning tree, uh, and it supports cl direct classic Ethernet host connections and connections to the traditional spanning tree switches. So by default. Fabric path switches transmit and process spanning tree PDUs on fabric path edge ports only. Uh, BPTUs do not cross fabric path core ports, and as a result, they don't get forward or tunnel through the fabric path network. So fabric path actually isolates spanning tree domains. So if you have multiple spanning tree domains connected to different areas on the fabric path network, uh, they will not send BPTUs to each other. They will be isolated islands unto themselves as spanning tree domains. Uh, when you're connecting sp classical Ethernet spanning tree domains to fabric path networks, uh, the fabric path is looks as if it's a, a single common bridge. And it'll have a common bridge ID that is C84C.75FA.6000. It's a burn, it's a, it's a it's a it's a bridge ID that is statically defined and it's not user configurable. Uh, every fabric path edge switch must be configured as a route for off fabric path VLAN. So if you have a VLANs across your fabric path network and you've defined them as fabric path VLANs, or when they connect on the edge ports to classical Ethernet switches, uh, those switches will be the root port, will be the STP route for all of those VLANs. If there are multiple fabric path edge switches that connect to the same domain for spanning tree, uh, all of the edge switches will use the same bridge priority value. So they will all be equally considered route in the, in the, and they will look as a single switch. Uh, by default, the root guard function is enabled implicitly. If a superior BPDU is received on a fabric of the edge port, the port's gonna be placed into uh, L2 gateway inconsistent state until that condition is clear. So uh, if somebody decides to put in a switch and do priority zero for a, span, a, a fabric path VLAN, it's gonna send a superior BPDU and it's going to put that port on the edge switches into an inconsistent state for that particular VLAN until you physically clear it. Okay, so fabric path is configured in a few steps on every single family fabric path switch. Uh, we talked about how simple it actually is compared to spanning tree. Uh, if it's not already installed, you need the enhanced layer two license to run fabric path. Uh, the command for that is to install license and then the file name for whatever platform you're actually using. Uh, if it hasn't already been installed, you must install the feature set so you will need to install feature dash set fabric path, uh, enable the fabric path feature globally, feature, feature set fabric path, it'll turn on fabric path and start all of those control plane functions running. And then you need to define your fabric path VLANs and those are gonna be the VLANs that are gonna extend across the fabric path network. So you just define the VLAN, uh, the range, what is a single VLAN, multiple VLANs, you can separate them with a dash if you're doing a range of them, or you can separate them as commas if there's a break in between them, but you need to set mode fabric path. If you don't set mode fabric path, they will be considered classical Ethernet VLANs. And then you have to identify and configure the fabric path core ports. Uh, the only 
requirement for that is to go into the interface connected to your other fabric path switches and switch port mode fabric path. So normally you would do switch port mode trunk uh, for regular trunks and VLANs. Uh, in this case, you're going to do switch port mode fabric path. This picture shows a lot of the, the simple configurations for each of the switches. This is a complete fabric path sample network for all of these switches. They can go into a single fabric path unified fabric. And then there are some commands that you can use to verify them. And as long as I still have my I and E rack up, let me make sure I have access to it here real quick. Hopefully you can also see my secure CRT screen. So one of the commands you can do is show feature. Oops. I cannot type. So this is going to show that the, the feature sets that are available and which ones are installed. This one was pre-installed. The fabric path is already installed and the feature set is enabled. Uh, just to look at the, show, the, the running config for the fabric path, you can do a show running config fabric path and it will show you just the configuration that was set to create fabric path. So you can see here we've, we've enabled the feature set fabric path. Uh, we've created two VLANs, VLAN 10 and 20, and set that for mode fabric path. Uh, we've created the switch ID as one in this particular instance. And then we've taken two of the ports that are connected to an, another, another 7000 switch and set those for fabric, ma fabric path mode. Uh, show VLAN will show you the VLANs that are available and whether they are in classical Ethernet mode or fabric path mode. You can see here all the VLANs and which mode that they are actually in. The VLAN 1 is in classical Ethernet and the two VLANs I created are in fabric path mode. If you want to look at the fabric path switch IDs that are available and configured, you can show fabric path switch ID. Now you can see here the big difference is that uh, <clears throat> there's a big difference. The one that we're on with based on the asterisk is switch ID 1. That's because I manually configured switch ID 1. And you can see here, statically configured is yes. Uh, this one was actually 2719 was created by the, the control plane protocol itself. I didn't specify which switch ID it would be. So it went ahead and configured it for me and made sure that it was unique. Show fabric path route will show the switch ID, the metric and the interface from which the switch is reachable. If you know the switch ID, you can find the path of the traffic is taking over the fabric path network to reach the remote switch. So we can do a show fabric path route. This is a very simple topology. Uh, in fact, it actually is only two, two ports directly connected to one other switch. So both of these ports are fabric path default ISIS ports. They've been up for two hours and 48 minutes. And here is the administrative distance and the metric. The local switch is local and here is the switch ID of the route for the other side and that's how you get to that that particular switch ID. We can show fabric craft ISIS interface brief. And that's going to show you the ISIS interfaces, the type of interfaces they are, the index, what their status is, what their circuit is, the MTU, the metric, the priority, and the adjacencies, and whether the adjacency is up or not. Uh, show MAC address table will normally display the MAC addresses for all the MAC addresses in their reachability. So it can help you find whether a MAC is present locally in the switch or whether it's connected to a remote switch. So if a MAC is connected to a remote switch, you can find a switch ID that, the, is, that has the, is the owner of that MAC address. Uh, I did not actually go beyond just setting up a, a small table. So there are actually no MAC addresses to, to look up. So you're not going to see anything in the demonstration. Uh, but if there was a large network and there was some conversational learning going on, showing MAC address would show you the MAC address table and it would show you uh, the actual switch IDs where the MAC addresses for those particular fabric path VLANs belong. And that is a brief overview of Fabric Path.
Okay, so now we're going to describe, configure, and verify uh, virtual port channels, which are VPCs, and virtual device contexts. Uh, virtual port channels, it basically enables an extension of a port channel across two physical switches. So you may be familiar with whether you, you do Arista or, or Extreme with their MLAG technology. Um, uh, Cisco has a technology mm -hmm. in the catalyst, which is called a virtual switching system, which allows you to basically combine the control plane of two separate physical switches into a single switch and lets you do something very similar. But virtual port channels support mostly just data center implementations, although you can use them in a campus network if you choose to. Uh, the member ports on a virtual port channel can come from two different network switches. Uh, it allows a doom holding of a downstream switch to two upstream switches. And there's no blocking in a VPC since it's <clears throat> as there are in traditional multi-home technology. So if you're using a traditional multi-home topology uh, where you have a single switch connected to regular switches that aren't connected via VPC or VSS, uh, they're going to be running spanning tree. And usually when they're running spanning tree, they're going to be blocking one port or another to ensure that there's loop-free topology. In VPC, while the physical topology is going to look like this, the picture on the left where the upstream switches are connected to a single downstream switch, uh, that's actually going to develop a, a port channel, an LACP port channel, and, and it'll it'll actually logically look like the picture on the right, where it's a single switch connected to a single upstream switch with two links. Right, virtual port channel components. Uh, there's a, a lot of them to make this this work. Uh, there are VPC peers, which are two Nexus switches combined in a to build a VPC domain. Uh, the VPC VPC spear, pardon me. The VPC peer link is a link between VPP, VPC spears, which synchronizes state. It's basically a control plane connection, so it'll perform a bunch of the control plane functions and sending over ARP and synchronizing uh, different different configurations and different uh, tables that need to be the same between both switches to successfully pull off doing the the logical port channel through the two multiple chassis. Uh, Cisco Fabric Service is the messaging protocol that's used to synchronize all the control, control plane data and inf information between the peers. Uh, the VPC peer keep alive link is a layer three communications path between peers. The keep alive link isn't terribly important other than it has to be up. It doesn't have to be a, a high bandwidth connection. It can either be uh, an out of band management connection. So management zero to management zero on two different switches can be done, whether it's a 100 meg link or 100 or one gig link. Uh, it can be in band if you wanted to create maybe a separate uh, virtual routing forwarding instance specifically for Keep Alive and, and send that over between two ports. Uh, as long as the two switches can have IP layer three connectivity, uh, that's considered a VPC peer link. Uh, the VPC itself is the layer two port channel that spans both peer switches. Uh, the VPC member port are ports that are members of the VPC peer on a peer switch. And the VPC domain is any pair of switches that are combined in VPC configuration. Uh, in this case, both of, both of these switches are VPC peer switches. Uh, and this is what would be considered a back-to-back -back, uh, VPC. Uh, there's VPC running from these switches to each of these switches. And then there's also VPC running from both of these switches to each of these switches in a port group. Uh, an orphan device is a term used to describe any device connected to only one VPC peer switch. So if you have a single connected server, it only has one NIC and you connect it to one side, that's going to be considered an orphan device. And an orphan port is going to be the switch port that that device is connected to. Uh, VPC VLANs are VLANs that are only allowed on the VPC. Uh, Non-VPC VLANs are going to be VLANs that are not part of any VPC and not present on the VPC peer link. So if you're doing any kind of VLAN pruning, uh, and you want to separate what goes across your VPC to your VPCs and you want to control what they are, you can do regular pruning. Uh, a lot of times people will just turn on trunking and it will just allow 0 through 4094 to go and whatever VLANs are on those switches are going to be eligible as VPC VLANs. Okay, virtual port channel and data plane operation. Again, the data plane is going to be user traffic. Uh, <clears throat> VPC is designed to forward traffic locally whenever possible. And by that, it means that the VPC, or VPC peer link is not used for regular traffic on a normal condition. So you're not going to see uh, a switch 
forward a packet to one VPC link and then have it go across the peer link to get to a destination. Uh, ideally, in normal conditions, uh, there will always be connectivity between both switches where one switch, whatever switch receives it and the, in the, in the upstream switch can get to that destination without traversing the peer link. Uh, the VPC implements loop avoidance at the data plane in, a hard, in hardware forwarding rules, so traffic received by one peer switch cannot be put back on the same VPC by the other switch. So if the data packet is traveling northbound to the switch on the left as in the picture, if it go crosses the peer link, it is in hardware not allowed to go be put back on that same VPC. Uh, or from ports use normal switch forwarding rules and they can use the VPC peer, uh, VPC peer link for transit. Uh, since it's a singly connected switch and it's considered an orphan port, uh, sometimes it only has the VPC peer link to be able to traverse to get to its destination. Uh, VPC loop avoidance rules are disabled for orphan ports. Now there's a distinction between an orphan port and orphan ports. So an orphan port is something that you've physically connected with a single connection. It is an orphan port. If there is an orphan port and there's an orphan server. A orphaned port is going to be something that was dual connected that for whatever reason, whether the, one of the VPC legs went down, uh, it becomes orphaned. And in that case, the loop avoidance rules are disabled because that's the only way it, that it can actually get that traffic out once in, in, the, in, the, in a failure scenario. VPC control plane operation. The VPC peer link is used to control, is used for control plane messaging such as BPDUs, LACP, Cisco Fabric Services over an Ethernet. Uh, Cisco Fabric Services over Ethernet is the primary control plane protocol for VPC and performs the fo following functions. It exchanges the layer two forwarding tables between VPC peers. It performs consistency and compatibility checks. Uh, it synchronizes the IGMP snooping status. We talked about some of the IGMP and the multi-destination trees for Fabric Path, but it also IGMP snooping is important for multicast, whether you're doing a VPC implementation or fabric path. Um, monitoring the status of the VPC member ports. Uh, it'll synchronize the ARP table. It determines primary and secondary VPC devices, so there's always going to be a hierarchy, uh, whether it is uh, automatically figured out through the automated rules or whether you specifically just type in a command to, to make one primary or secondary. Uh, it's going to determine whether they're primary or secondary if you don't individually set what those are going to be. And it's going to agree on LACP and spanning tree protocol parameters. And all the data, all the control plane operations are in place in support of the data plane operations. Uh, all of these functions are used to determine how the behavior of data plane is going to happen. So the VPC has limitations. So while it's an important technology in the data center, it's also imperative to understand that it does have some limitations and some of the key limitations are that you can only have two switches per VPC domain. So a VPC domain can only consist of two switches or virtual device context, which we're gonna talk about in the next section, that have a shared VPC domain ID. Uh, only one VPC domain ID per switch. It's not possible for a switch or a VDC to participate in more than one VPC domain. So you have a set of switches you provide a single VPC domain, you cannot create a second VPC domain. It's only going to have the one, it's only going to have the one control plane. Whether you're doing a, splitting it with a VDC, which is a virtual device contact, or whether it's just basically two physical switches running in a VPC. Uh, each VDC is going to be a separate switch. So while uh, VPC is a per VDC function, when you're running VDCs, which are virtual device contacts, which allows you to cut a physical switch up into multiple virtual switches, uh, each virtual switch in a VDC is considered a completely separate entry, a entity, including control plane, uh, in most part management plane, as well as data plane. So you actually need a separate VPC peer link and keep alive link for each VDC. So if you're running, say, a Cisco 7000 that has four VDCs defined, uh, and they're all participating with two physical switches and there's four VP VDCs in each switch, uh, they're all considered separate domains. And so you actually have to have four separate peer links and four separate uh, keep alive links in order to make those work. Uh, the peer link is always going to be 10 gigabits per second or more. Only 10 gigabit Ethernet ports can be used for a VPC peer link. Uh, you can port channel them for redundancy, uh, but they always are going to have to be a 10 gigabit link or a bundle of 10 gigabit links or up, whether it's 40 or 100, uh, 10, giga link, 10 gigabit per second links are the minimum. Uh, a VPC 
is a layer two port channel only. Uh, it does not support the configuration of layer three port channels. So when you're gonna configure a virtual port channel, and I'm gonna apologize for the slide in advance because there is a step missing, I'm gonna talk about it. The first thing you have to do is you have to enable the VPC feature. Uh, everything in the Nexus switches are gonna be a feature. Uh, they did that specifically to reduce the amount of overhead in the switches. So rather than turning everything on and then having to deal with all the different overhead, now you have to turn on specific features. If you don't need to run LACP or you don't need to run VPC, you don't need to run the process. Uh, by not running the processes that you don't use, it makes the switch more secure, it makes it more stable, and it reduces the amount of computing power required to actually perform the functions. Um, creating a VPC domain and assigning ID, you use the command VPC domain and then you pick a domain ID. Uh, you need to establish peer keep alive connectivity like we discussed before. Uh, the command for that is going to be peer dash keep alive, destination, the remote peer ID, the source, which is the local IP if, if you need to put it in, and then the VRF that it's going to be on. By default, it's going to be VRF management, so you don't actually have to type in the source or VRF management if it's going to be the VR, VRF is management. If you're going to do a separate keep alive VRF or it's going to use the default VRF, then you're going to have to specify the source that's going to come from and what VRF that source belongs to. Um, creating the peer link, you're going to, going to have to go into the, and this is the part that's missing, for each of the peer link and the VPC, you need to go into the actual member ports and create the port channel. So you're going to have to go in and to the individual ports and type in channel group, whatever the port group you want it to be, mode active to turn it on as an LACP port to participate. So in this example, they're using Ethernet 9, 21 through 22. Oops, sorry. Can't highlight with a, with a left mouse click. So uh, interface Ethernet 9, 21 to 22, that's gonna create a range, and then that range is gonna have applied the switch port and channel group one mode active. That puts both those ports in channel group port one. So at that point, you can go to the here and you type an interface port channel, in this case one, switch port mode trunk, to turn it into a trunk and then type in VPC peer link to identify it as the peer link. Once you identify it as a peer link, it's gonna go from being a regular trunk to actually passing control plane information between the two switches once you've done both sides. And then you just create a VPC, a virtual port channel. You just go into the same thing. You pick your port that you want it to be. You create a port channel item. In this case, we're using a port channel two uh, with port 920 on both switches. So they are gonna be two separate switches. 920 is gonna be collapsed together into a single VPC, even though it's on two, two, chat, two separate chassis. And then you go into the port channel on both sides and you type in the VPC number. Once you type in the VPC number, that tells the port to start passing control plane information across the VPC peer link and then it'll bond them together and it'll synchronize all the information for that particular one and it'll appear to the downstream switch as if it's a single port channel from a single chassis. So and there's a couple things you need to verify VPC and I've mm -hmm. configured some VPC on my INE rack for you. Uh, the 5K has the single connection on it, and then there's a 7K. There's actually two 7Ks, but we're only looking at one side of it. So if you wanted to do the show feature on the 5K, you can see that LACP is enabled here. If you need to show the running config for all the VPC, you can show the running config VPC. Oh, sorry. VPC 10, VPC, um, all right, that one appears to be wrong. My apologies. Actually, I'm sorry. It's on the wrong switch. So the, the 7K is where the actual two chassis are. So that's where the VPC exists. So if you want to look at the VPC configuration, uh, you see the VPC domain one has been established. It has peer, the peer switch command. So it's one of the peer switches. Uh, peer keep alive is using the management VRF because we did not specify a source or the VRF. So this does the destination is 192.168.0.78. Uh, 
Uh, this this one is actually 192.168.0.77. And we went into the port channel that we created and we created a VPC peer link and then the peer link to interface port channel 10. If you wanted to do a show port channel Port channel, I'm sorry, summary. You can see that port channel 10 has two participating links in it on this particular switch. And if you go to the other switch, it has two as well. But if you look at show port channel, summary here on the switch, there's actually four. Uh, there's an inconsistency with the physical cabling, which is why this one is considered down. But you can see that there are actually four links in this port channel on the switch that's considered the downstream switch because the upstream switch, uh, there are two of them, each with two links, and then put into a single VPC. Uh, before the VPC will come up, it has to be consistent. So you can look at the consistency parameters. for VBC 10, and it'll show you that uh, all of these should match. If they don't match, it will actually bring that VPC down, other than the suspended VLANs, because they're these aren't actually going anywhere. They're, they're fabric path VLANs. You can show the VPC keep alive. Shows you how long the keep alive has been up. Uh, the sense status was a success, what the hold timers are, the VRF that it's associated with, and VPC roll. Shows you that this is the secondary switch, the other switch is going to be the primary, uh, the VPC system MAC address, the system priority, which is the default, because uh, we didn't set it, system MAC address, and the VPC local role priority. And that is basically VPCs. And then we're moving into more of the virtual device context in the Nexus 7000 series switch. Hey, Shane, so, got, a, uh, got a question from chat sure. here. When you're setting up the VPC, uh, is there a good list or uh, doc on which commands you do uh, just in config T mode or in uh, config sync mode? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I can look it up on, on Cisco and grab the thing. There's a fact that I had. I didn't actually get it. I put it in the uh, thing, but it has a lot of that information. Uh, the, the the commands that we put in are for interactive commands. I understand that you can do you, know, you, you can do some commands first and then do a commit. Uh, all the commands that we did in this one were all interactive. Okay, cool. But I, I, can, I can certainly send it out to you right. and make sure that everybody gets it if they want it, if you want to post it somewhere. Will do, thanks. The virtual device context on the next 7000 series switch allows you to basically take a, a single physical switch and create multiple can, what we consider virtual switches that are that are going to look exactly like physical switches. Uh, the VDCs are used to net virtualize the Nexus 7000 switch. Uh, by default, it runs a single VDC called the default VDC. And that default VDC is always active and it cannot be deleted. It doesn't, doesn't matter whether you're a network admin or not. Uh, Inside that VDC, you can virtualize using VLANs and virtual routing and forwarding instances. Um, when you create multiple VDCs, those VLAN and VRF processes are replicated for each of the VDCs separately. They do not have any, any bearing on each other. So if you have multiple VDCs on your physical switch, a VRF production can be the same name and have the same uh, routes as another VRF production and another VDC, and they will not interfere with each other in any way, shape, or form. And when you enable uh, role-based authentication for each of the VDCs, each of the VDC admins are going to interact with their VDC separately, meaning uh, a VDC admin for one VDC cannot do administrative, in administrative commands in another VDC. They can't even access the VDC. When you do multiple VDCs, the use cases for it are, are a couple of things. Uh, whether you want to create a separate production development and test environment, uh, you can create completely separate 
physical instances of those. So you can, if you have a, a production environment and you want to do a test dev in another VDC, so you can provide, you know, testing and you can do some real world stuff as if it's a physical switch without investing in another physical switch. Uh, you can use an XS7000 to create another VDC that is an exact duplicate from an allocation and resource standpoint of the one that you have in production. Uh, if you want to, again, avoid the cost of having multiple extra physical devices and the port density of the 7000 supports are having a lot of uh, ports, uh, you can collapse everything down in sort of a vertical collapse to create an internet, an extranet, and a DMZ switch. Uh, if you have multiple organizations on the same physical switch and they need to have separation, uh, you can create a separate VDC for each of the organizations. Uh, multiple if you have an application that for some reason whether it's a pci would be a good example maybe you want to have some extra uh, separation from your pci environment from your normal production for, for from you know whether you're doing a SOC audit or, or some other other issue um, or if you just need to have two departments that just basically hate each other and they won't allow you to, to, to manage their services and they want to be completely separate even though they're in the same organization uh, you can just basically separate it out from that standpoint and give each of them their own vdc uh, the VDC separation is industry certified. It's NSS Labs for payment card industry processing. Uh, it is FIPS 140-2 uh, compliant and common criteria at EAL4. So even the government will consider VDC implementations as separate switches if you're doing some sort of common criteria. There are different types of VDCs. Uh, the VDCs basically partition the physical nexus into multiple logical devices with separate control plane, data plane, and management. So you, as we talked about before, uh, we have the control plane and the data plane and the management plane, the control plane being used to provide all the information for the data plane to be able to function and behave the way you ask. And the management plane is basically a, a hook for you to be able to, whether it's through a CLI or some other automated process, uh, to go in and, and actually change the control plane so that it can actually uh, change the behavior of the data plane. It's for the configuration and, and health monitoring uh, of the control plane. Uh, the VDCs cannot be connected to each other internally on the chassis, so one of the separation, uh, especially for the appliance port, is that if you do a separate VDC within a single chassis, uh, there is no way across the crossbar on the back of the chassis or whatever happens to be back there providing a connectivity from you know certain ASICs to other ASICs when you when you separate the ports and allocate them out to each of the VDCs. There's zero internal connectivity. There is no way to 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 breach that gap, and it's been certified certified to EAL four. Um, <clears throat> The default VDC is a full function VDP, VDC that can be used to manage the physical device. It's going to come up first. It's the it's the default VDC when you boot the switch at first, uh, and it can perform certain functions that no other VDCs can do. So it can the VDC can create and delete and suspend other VDCs. Uh, it is the VDC that you can use to res allocate resources, whether those resources are interfaces or memory, to other VDCs. So if you're spitting off a VDC for a test dev lab and they only need uh, say eight ports you can configure eight ports on a single line cord and tell it, line card and tell it that it's part of this VDC now uh, and then they have access to that and only those ports and they can physically connect them up to other switches or other services they see fit without inter any kind of interference with anything else on the switch uh, you can perform NSX o NX OS upgrades across all VDCs from the default VDC uh, if you need to do firmware uh, upgrades on your line cards, you can do a function called an EPLD upgrade, uh, usually uh, directed by the TAC. Or if you're doing an upgrade, there's going to be an EPLD file uh, that's associated with the same image that you have, so they can be consistent and it'll it'll go through the process and upgrade your line cards to make sure they're compatible with your NXOS. Uh, Ether analyzer capture. So one of the cool features of a Nexus switch is that there's actually a command line version of Wireshark built into the Nexus switches that you can use to look at control plane traffic. So if you're having an issue, maybe you're running DHCP on a switch and it, it tra or traffic for some reason is being punted to this, punted to the control plane and you need to see exactly what it's doing, uh, Ether Analyzer Capture will allow you to actually look at that control plane traffic. Um, you can do feature set installations, whether you're doing uh, effects, which we're going to talk about next week which is the Nexus 2000, or whether you're doing feature sets for Fabric Path and FCOE. Uh, in VD, regular VDCs, uh, you can't imp implement those features. You have to implement them in, in the default VDC or the admin VDC. Um, the default VDC is where you're going to do control plane policing. 
Uh, that's where you're going to set the limits on uh, the data and the speed with which that data can hit the control plane of the switch so that you don't have to necessarily fall to an, uh, an inadvertent or a purposeful denial of service event. Uh, port channel load balancing. Uh, in a regular VDC, when you're running port channels, uh, you can't change the, the port channel hashing algorithm. Uh, you have to change the port channel hashes algorithm from the default VDC or the admin VDC, and then an ACL capture feature. The, a non-default VDC is any other VDC that doesn't have a special, it's not going to be an admin VDC, it's not the default VDC, and it's not a storage VDC, which we're going to talk about in a minute. The non-default VDC is just your standard vanilla VDC. You need to spin off another VDC to do something, whether it's for another organization, whether it's another application, PCI, whatever. It's a fully functional VDC that's created from the default VDC or an admin VDC. It changes the non-default <clears throat> changes in that VDC affect only that VDC. Uh, everything in it, from the control data and management planes, are independent processes. So you can have a separate configuration file. Uh, each VDC has its own non-default VDC, VDC has going to have its own role-based authentication. It can have its own SNMP strings and its own monitoring. Uh, it, it can have uh, overlapping VLANs with other VDCs because they're not the same switch, et cetera. Uh, the admin VDC is a special VDC, and it's used for only administration purposes. Uh, it can be created in a number of ways. You, you, during a fresh switch boot, you can be prompted to select the an admin VDC. So if you're bringing it up for the first time and it wants you to select the VDC for the admin VDC, VDC you can tell it that I want the default VDC to be, be an admin VDC. Um, if you've already booted it up and you want to convert something to an admin VDC, you can convert a, a VDC to an admin VDC using the system admin VDC command once it's been booted up. Uh, if you want to create an admin VDC based on a new to a new VDC name, uh, you can do a system admin VDC migrate and it'll migrate to the new VDC name. Uh, the admin VDC cannot have features or feature sets enabled. Uh, you cannot assign any interfaces to the admin VDC. And when you enable the admin VDC, it replaces the default VDC. So you can't have a default and an admin VDC. You either have a default VDC, which has all the features of a regular VDC plus the administrative control, or you have an admin VDC, which takes the place of the default VDC, but does not have the ability to function as a normal VDC. Um, once it's been created, it can't be deleted or changed back to a default VDC. So some of the advantages are in the earlier soups and the earlier licenses, you could have four VDCs and, and you could have one of them would be the default VDC or the admin VDC. Uh, then they started coming out with licenses and, and features with newer soups where you could have a, a four plus one, where now you could have four VDCs plus you could have an admin VDC. So it didn't really count against your VDCs. So it wasn't a penalty for having an admin VDC. Uh, then they went to some of the soups, enhanced soups. Uh, now they have eight plus one based on the licensing. So you, you, the plus one is basically for your admin VDC. Since the admin VDC can only do administrative functions and can't function as regular VDC, uh, they modified it so that it wouldn't actually be a penalty to the number of VDCs that you can have on a switch. The storage VDC, it's, it's a non-default VDC that helps maintain an operational model if you have uh, I'm sure everywhere you've worked, uh, if the SAN admin and the LAN, LAN admin are all at odds, they don't want to each other to touch everything. In a hyper-converged network space, everybody hates each other. Uh, if you're used to doing LAN stuff, the SAN guy doesn't trust you. If you're a SAN guy, you don't trust the LAN people. So the storage VDC allows you to separate that out. And the storage VDC is specifically for storage technologies. It actually doesn't even require a VDC license. So if you're only doing a storage VDC, uh, it actually works from the... FCOE license and, and it counts against a VDC in the total number of VDCs. So if you have four plus one VDCs and you're running a storage VDC, you still only can have three non-default VDCs. Uh, but if you're only running a regular VDC and you don't have a license for a bunch of other ones, it doesn't matter. You don't have to have the VDC license. You can just use the FCOE license. Uh, you can only have one storage VDC per physical switch. And, the v and it can only have a dedica dedicated FCOE interfaces and shared interfaces that carry both FCOE and Ethernet traffic. So when you actually create your VDCs, you have to allocate resources to it. So when you initially put in a VDC, it doesn't have any ports. So all interfaces are initially assigned to the default VDC. Once you create a physical v a VDC, uh, you need to be able to start creating physical interfaces that can be assigned to it. So a physical interface can only belong to one VDC at a time. So once you actually move a physical interface, 
from, say, the default VDC to another non-default VDC. Uh, it does not exist in both places. It physically moves to the other VDC. You cannot do an int E1 slash, say, 1 in a VDC that you, move, that you moved it from. It doesn't exist anymore. Uh, when you're creating shared interfaces, which are sp special interfaces for uh, storage VDCs, they actually belong to a single Ethernet for the FCOE portion, for the Ethernet portion, and one in the storage VDC at the same time. Uh, and when you allocate physical interfaces, once you move it from one, so if you configure a bunch of inter Ethernet interfaces, you do a bunch of default interfaces, uh, default configuration for your interfaces, and you put them in a single VDC, when you move them and allocate them to another VDC, those configurations go away. Uh, also, when you create a VDC, when you when you allocate a, a port for a VDC, it's not just the one port that goes. It's based on the port groups. So if you have a say an N7K M132XP-12 line card, uh, those interfaces are in eight port groups. So when you put one interface from an eight port group into another VDC, all eight in that port group has to go, and it'll allocate it as such, whether you specify it or not. Okay, so VDC inter administration it uses role-based access control. There are four default user roles that are provided within XOS. Um, the permitted operations in a VDC for user depends on the role assigned to the user, and a user can be assigned multiple roles. So the following are the default user roles. You have network admin, which is the first user account created on the default VDC. It's admin, and it's actually automatically put in as a network admin role. Uh, the network admin role is automatically assigned to that user. The network admin role provides complete read and write access for the entire switch. Uh, multiple VDCs, it doesn't matter. Uh, the role is only available in the default VDC or admin VDC. Uh, the network admin role can create, delete, and change non-default VDCs. So this is the only one that can actually start going around and creating other VDCs. Uh, the network operator role doesn't get any user assigned to it by default. Uh, that network operator role has read-only rights, so the default or admin VDC. Uh, the role includes the right to do a switch to command, which allows you to switch from the default or admin VDC to another non-default VDC. So you would, if you named another VDC, say, production, uh, you would do a switch to VDC production, and it would allow that user to access the non-default VDC from the default VDC. Uh, and that role must be specifically assigned by to a user by a user who's assigned the network admin role. So only a network admin role can create users in the network operator role. Um, the VDC admin role and the VDC operator are identical to the network admin and the network operator, except that they are uh, scaled down and they only have access to the VDC that they were created for. So when you create a new VDC, the first user is an admin and it's automatically gonna be the VDC admin role. The network admin role, it provides complete read and write access, but only to the non-default VDC it's in. Uh, the role has no rights to any other VDC. You can't use switch to or switch back to get to any other VDC or get to a higher level VDC. You are basically trapped in the VDC that it was created in. Uh, VDC operator, same thing. No users are assigned to that role by default. Uh, the VDC operator role has read only rights to the VDC it's in, and it has no rights to any other VDC. Uh, and I think I actually have a, I'm sure my VPN is still up here. Uh, there are some commands specific to the VDCs. I'll see if I can come over here and see if I can find a 7K. Please don't hold the showing you production year in. So this is a production 7K, and this is the production VDC. So if you do a show VDC inside the production VDC, it's going to show you information on each of the VDCs. So in this particular switch has a private, a public, and a storage VDC. Um, if you switch to another VDC, a non-default VDC, and you do a show VDC, it's only going to show you information in the VDC that it is being run in. Uh, show VDC detail is very much the same. If you're in a local VDC, it's only going to show you the VDC ID 3, which happens to be this public dash SR VDC. And, but if you switch back to the default VDC, 
Can you show VDC detail? It should show you that same for all the VDCs. So the, the four different VDCs. Uh, if you want to look at see what is ports are assigned to each of the VDCs, if you're in the default VDC, you can see uh, VDC zero has zero allocated interfaces, and these are all the VDC and what interfaces are assigned to each one. And there will not be a single one in one that is also in the other. Uh, if you want to do a copy VD, a copy running startup config, you can do that from the default VDC for all the VDCs. So copy run start VDC all. Oops. Do a dash in there. And that should roll through each of the VDCs, and it's going to go through and do a copy run start in each of the four VDCs without going each of them individually with the switch to command. All right. Identify key differentiators between DCI, which is data center interconnect, and network interconnectivity. All right, so there are, for very, very long, there has been a lot of different data center interconnect solutions that have been available, whether it's uh, Ethernet over multi-protocol label switching, E over MPLS. Uh, you know, you can use that to provide point-to-point -point layer two Ethernet connection between the two sites using MPLS as a transport. Uh, virtual private LAN services, which is similar to M E over MPLS, but it uses an underlying transport network. Mm -hmm. And instead of using pseudo wires, it does a multi-access network. Uh, you can connect it directly with dark fiber. But in the end, they all have issues that you have to overcome. So if you're connecting two sites together, whether or not you're worried about, you know, layer two extensions and uh, effective use of your bandwidth or uh, complexity of the operations, because now you're muddling together in multiple mechanisms trying to fight some of these other challenges. Uh, basically, while it wants you to determine the key difference between a internet connectivity and a data center inter interconnect, what they're really trying to say is they want you to know OTV, which is overlay transport virtualization. So under normal circumstances, challenges using layer two exemptions, you have failure isolation issues. Uh, you're extending layer two domains between multiple data center sites and you can extend the fault domain. So if you extend spanning tree between two separate sites and you end up in a loop somehow because you're multi-homed or some other problem happened, uh, problems can spill over from one site to another. And uh, there are multiple mechanisms to prevent that from happening. Uh, but those are usually going to be kludges or uh, multiple protocols connected together. Uh, you got varying transport infrastructures, whether you're using VPLS, Ethernet over MPLS, um, you know, Comcast, Business Internet, MPLS. Uh, those are going to vary greatly in price from location to location, so you don't have any real control over, over, over you know, budget or technology, depending on what's available in your area. Um, loop prevention in a multi-home environment, again, you're extending multiple LAN connections between two environments. You've got layer two coming over. Uh, you have issues with loop prevention. Uh, if you do prevent loop, loops from happening, you might be shutting down one of your links. So now you're not using effective use of your bandwidth or for replication, and you're not load, load balancing. You're using your path diversity to the optimization that you really need to. And then this complexity of operations. Uh, layer two VPNs and layer two connectivity usually have a mixture of protocols and other mechanisms trying to combat all of these problems. So it ends up being a, some sort of kludge uh, thrown together with uh, various vendors or various protocols being used. And it becomes very complex. And now you've got your network guy who is you know, driving himself crazy just trying to make sure that you know nothing goes wrong because it's his ass. And that's where OTV comes in. So Cisco introduced overlay transport virtualization a while ago. Uh, it set out to fix all of those problems in a very concise format. Uh, it provides layer two extensions between remote data centers using MAC address routing, so versus flooding. Uh, the control plane protocol is used to exchange MAC address reachability information between the network devices providing the extension. Uh, it can only, it's only deployed on specific edge devices. So right now uh, there might be, there might be one or two others. I think maybe the ASR 9000. Uh, but the Cisco Nexus 7000 and 7700 with transport services license uh, can support OTV and the Cisco ASR series with advanced IP services or advanced enterprise services license. Uh, it has built in multi-homing 
using the same control plane that, that, it, that provides a loop prevention mechanism. So you don't need to run, span, run extended spanning tree protocol across the transport infrastructure. Uh, each site has its own spanning tree domain, even though they all share a common layer two domain. So now you have you know, layer two mobility between sites, but you don't have the issue of spanning tree protocol. And it runs it over an IP transport. So it doesn't really matter what it is, whether it's, uh, you know, DWDM, CWDM, dark fiber, um, packet over sonnet. As long as you have IP reachability on either side, you can run OTV. So the OTV control plane, one of the key different traders is that it runs a single control plane and runs between all of the edge devices. Its function is to advertise MAC address reachability between the edge devices. And instead of, relying, instead of relying on the data plane to learn it by flooding layer two traffic across the transport infrastructure, uh, it exchanges MAC reachability information to the OTV edge devices. They have to become adjacent. The OTV edge devices become adjacent in one of two ways, depending on the transport infrastructure. If multicast is enabled, uh, you can do multicast enabled transport. Uh, if you, by doing that, you use the multicast group to exchange the control protocol message between the edge devices. So instead of having, you know, specifically having to pick out and, and point it at all of the different OTV edge devices and maybe do some sort of mesh configuration, uh, you can use multicast. So if multicast is enabled, no matter how many edge devices are part of the OTV, uh, they will send out multicast messages, they will find each other and they will populate their own trees and start exchanging information automatically. Uh, if multicast isn't enabled and you have unicast enabled transport, you can perform, you can, you can set up one of the OTV edge devices for what they call a, an adjacency server. And so what you can do there, rather than having to build this large tree and this, this huge mesh if you have multiple OTV edge devices, is you have a single edge device or two edge devices acting as adjacency servers, you point all the other edge devices to it in a unicast fashion, and it builds a, a list that it passes out of everything it learns to all of the other devices that it forms an adjacency with. So at that point, all of the adjacency, all, all the OTV edge devices know how to reach all the other edge devices. Okay, OTV data plane for unicast, if it's inside the same site, works just like everything else. It doesn't really matter whether OTV exists or not, it's almost as if OTV doesn't exist. Uh, both servers that are communicating in this instance because the intersite reside in the same data center, a layer two frame is gonna be received at the aggregation device, which in this case happens to be an OTV edge device with a MAT2 as a destination address. The aggregation device, aggregation device performs a normal layer two lookup to determine how to reach MAC2. It sees MAC2 is on Ethernet 1 and the frame is delivered to the destination. It's uh, just like traditional networking without multiple sites. Where OTV comes in is when you're doing intersite. And then when both servers are in different data centers but they belong to the same overlay. Uh, you can have multiple overlays in across data centers. So if these two devices all belong to the same overlay, the layer two frame, if you're running say MAC1 to MAC3, it's gonna be received at the aggravation device, which is also, which happens to be one of the O2B edge devices with MAC3 as a destination MAC. And now rather than, it's gonna do a lookup, but now rather than seeing that it has a, a ethernet address, it's gonna see an IP address. And that IP address is gonna be the IP address of the remote OT edge device. When it sees that, if the OTV edge device is going to encapsulate the frame using IP addresses of the join interfaces for the edge devices that for the source edge device and the destination edge device as a source and destination in the header. After that encapsulation, it's going to send it over the transport as a normal IP packet. It doesn't really matter. If as long as it has IP reachability, it's been encapsulated and it's going to be sent over that transport infrastructure and it's going to reach the site the OTV edge device. It's going to receive that packet. It's going to decapsulate it, leaving it as the original layer two frame, just as if it had gone intrasite. And it's going to do the same layer two lookup to determine where MAC3 belongs. And it's going to see that MAC3 in this particular table, since it's on the same side where MAC3 belongs, it's going to see that it's on Ethernet3 and it's going to deliver it to its destination. And you know, it also has functions for handling unknown unicast traffic. Um, if the MAC address is in a remote data center, the OTV protocol will map the MAC address to the destination IP address of the remote data center. When the OTV edge device receives a frame destined for a MAC address that is not in this MAC address table, it's gonna flow that frame out to internal, all of his internal interfaces, but it's not gonna send it over the overlay. The OTV edge device assumes that if 
it doesn't have a MAC address for what it considered, and this is what it's going to consider a silent host. So no silent hosts are available. And that means that if it hasn't seen it talking, it doesn't exist as far as it's concerned. So it's going to flood it out to local interfaces to see if it can pick it up. Otherwise, the OTV Edge device is going to learn the MAC address, and it's going to assume that it's going to, at some point, this, the other site's going to have to talk out, and it's going to learn that MAC address through normal conversation. Um, that doesn't isn't always the case, especially when you're running some technologies like some sort of Microsoft Network load balancing services. Uh, it started out that you could use a static entry to be to be added to the MAC address table of the OTV Edge device as a workaround, so that it would actually you could physically put that in there if you knew it wasn't going to be conversational and it wasn't going to be le learn it. But beginning with NXOS 6.2.2. Uh, they came out with a selected unknown unit patch flooding based on MAC address. And you can use the command OTV flood MAC, the MAC address you need, VLAN, and the VLAN it belongs to. And that's important for features like NLB, NLBS, or Microsoft Network Load Balancing Services, because it relies on actually flooding the function. And I misspelled function. Hey, Shane, uh, so a couple of slides ago, you showed OTV for interest site. Uh -huh. So a uh, question came up is, you know, why would you run that interest site in that case, or is that just an example right. showing what happens? Uh, it's, it, it's an example. It actually isn't using the OT, the overlay. It's uh, be, it's just showing what the, the, the normal data center, even though it has an overlay, if both addresses go hung on the same side, OTV doesn't come into play. It does the normal lookup. It has the same lookup tables. It's really just an example. Uh, OTV is only for site-to-site -site information. Uh, that was just an example of what an intra-site lookup would look like uh, without the encapsulation from the OTV Edge device, even though it was going through an OTV Edge device. It ignores the OTV because it's on. it has it in the MAC tables on the same side. Okay, great. Thanks. No, no problem. The OTV multi-homing. All right, multi-homing is a native feature in OTV. So if you need to put in multiple OTV Edge devices on each side to provide LAN extensions and you want to have some sort of, you know, you don't want to have one go down, so you need to have high availability. Uh, OTV doesn't send Spanish Ruby PDUs across the overlay because that could end in an end to end loop. It uses what they call an authoritative edge device to support multi homing and provide loop avoidance. The authoritative edge device role is elected on a per VLAN basis at any given site. So if you have multiple uh, edge devices at a site, it's going to elect one of them to be the, the AED. Uh, it's going to to do that, you need to have a VLAN called the site VLAN within the site to detect adjacencies with other OTV edge devices in the same site. And it also means a secondary adjacency over the OTV join interface across the layer three domain. That's the overlay adjacency. Um, to enable that functionality, to, to be able to, to avoid loop for loop avoidance, you have to have all the edge devices in the same site have to be configured with a, a site identifier value that is the same. So when you identify Every single edge device, if you have two edge devices on one site and two edge devices on the other, uh, site A is both those edge devices are going to have the same site identifier value. And on site B, they're going to have the same site identifier value for site B, but it will be different than site A. So they can differentiate between them when they're sending traffic back and forth. Uh, the site identifier is then advertised by ISIS hello packets. And you, along with that, in system ID, it's used to identify neighbors that are belonging to the same site so they don't get into any kind of, uh, any kind of loops. And I'm sorry, I'm a lot over, but uh, this is, I actually pared this down really fast so I, we wouldn't go too far over. Uh, describe and configure Nexus products. Okay, the operational planes of a Nexus switch. Uh, the data center network is built using multiple network devices. In this case, we're looking at all the Nexus, the, the Nexus nodes. Uh, nodes are connected together and configured in different topologies. Uh, the network nodes are comprised of three operational components. You have the data plane, which is also called the forwarding plane. We talked about that before. Uh, it's where all the user traffic is, is forwarding, forwarding through. We have the control plane that maintains the information required for the data plane to operate. So the control plane is where all the rules exist and all the protocols exist that, that describe how the data plane is going to behave as traffic flows across it. And then the management plane is responsible for configuration and monitoring of the control plane. So it's where you're going to look at, it's going to have the, in, the uh, hooks in for SNMP, for configuration, whether it's CLI or through some other automated process. Uh, the data plane is uh, it receives endpoint traffic from network interface and makes forwarding decisions. Those forwarding decisions are based on the destination address. Uh, the Nexus 5500, in this case, the architecture consists of two custom-built ASICs. Uh, in the old days, probably two years ago, three years ago, 
they didn't have they saw a lot of switches didn't necessarily have uh, application specific interface uh, ICs. Uh, they used either risk processors or regular reg regular processors to do forwarding decisions. And they were very slow. They actually uh, had to perform software based lookups, just like uh, firewalls today. Rule a lot of rules are based on on on, on regular processors, and they, they tend to be a little bit slower from a packet processing standpoint. Uh, ASICs were developed, uh, and in this case, there are two custom built ASICs that Cisco came up with. One is the unified port controller that provides packet processing on ingress and egress interfaces. So every single SFP has a is paired up with a a port group that is connected to an ASIC. Uh, and then the unified crossbar fabric, which provides the switching fabric to cross connecting all all of those unified port controllers, and that is the basic. <clears throat> I'm sorry, that is the basic architecture of how they they connect to to each other and and how they can get back and forth. The, the crossbar is massively. Uh, most of the all the 5500s are are full 10 gig. Every port can talk at the same time without any kind of contention across the backplane. So it's very very robust and very, very small latency because they're using the ASICs versus uh, just regular processing power. Uh, data plane switching modes, <clears throat> the Nexus 5500 uses two switching modes depending on the uh, speed of the source and interface and destination interface and certain, certain characteristics. So the store and forward switching, uh, data packets are received and stored in switch memory or the ASIC before forwarding. Uh, it's characterized by error checking, buffering, and access control list. So since it's actually being completely stored before it sends it on, it's it's a little bit more latent. It takes a little bit longer, but it gives you the ability to uh, uh, buffer it. If you the egress port might be a little bit slow, uh, it allows you to check it against access control lists in case you have some sort of policy. And it also lets you do the frame check sequence, uh, check it to make sure that the the, the port is that the, the packet's actually intact and it didn't get mangled some way across the wire. Uh, cut through switching, on the other hand forwards the frame before it's been completely received. Uh, it only reads the frame far enough to know what the destination is before it shoots it out to the other side. Uh, it's very low latency, but it can also send out invalid packets. If it finds that the packet's invalid by then it's too late, it's actually going to be sent to the other side. And it only it's only going to buffer uh, if there's egress port congestion. Uh, the other rule is that the it is going to be cut through as long as the interfaces are the same speed. If the source interface is the same or greater than the destination interface, except for one gigabit Ethernet to one gigabit Ethernet. Sorry about that. One gigabit Ethernet to one gig Ethernet. One gig Ethernet to one gig Ethernet in the 5500 is going to be stored and forward, even though they're the same. Uh, one gigabit, ten gig. Its uh, source is slower than the egress, so it's going to be stored and forward. Uh, but in the other case where it's 10 gig going to 10 gig or 10 gig going to 1 gig, it's going to behave as a cut through switch. Uh, the control plane, it maintains all the information necessary for the data plane operations. It includes things such as the Cisco Discovery Protocol, uh, it reaches out across all the layer two and finds out the information and, and capabilities of all the other switches it's connected to if you're running the protocol, uh, bi directional forwarding. Uh, unit directional link detection if you're running uh, fiber or you run UDLD if you have a uh, receive down or transmit down, it's going to be unit electrical link. You can detect that and, and, and act appropriately. Uh, LACP, ARP, spanning tree protocol, fabric path, all of those are basically control plane because every single one of those has something to do with the behavior or the how, how the data plane is going to behave and react. Uh, the management plane is the place in the network you node know, that deals with the configuration and monitoring control plane. It provides an interface to the network administrators and NMS tools, whether it's a DCNM, um, open flow, uh, any kind of REST processing you do, power CLI, if it, if it supports it. Uh, it can let you configure the network node using command line interface, uh, using management protocol, network management protocols. It lets you monitor statistics by collecting health and utilization data. And it can manage the network node using an element manager. All right, so the, the final step was uh, doing the performing initial setup, and I knew this was going to run long, so I will apologize in advance. I didn't, I wasn't able to get a switch that I could actually uh, console to or run through an initial setup. But when you first boot up a switch, or well, whether you write erase it or if it comes right out of the box, it's going to give you the option of doing what they call a a initial setup, and it's basically a script. And we're just going to go over really quick what some of those elements are when you first set it up. Uh, it's going to ask you if you want to enforce a secure password standard, and that just basically means that you're going to need to have a minimum of eight characters with a combination of alphabet, upper and lowercase, and a numerical character in the password. So uh, you say yes or no, depending on what your password 
policy is, and then they hear they're entering admin, the admin password, which is the first password you have to set, so you can, um, oops, sorry, so you can configure the box. And that's going to tell you basically that the setup utility is going to guide you through the basic configuration. It's going to configure only enough connectivity for the management of the system. Um, you're not going to be able to set up features, VPCs, uh, fabric path or anything like that. This is really just so that you can configure management access to the box so that you can start configuring those yourselves or whatever your whatever method you're using, whether it's CLI or some other system. Um, it's for setting it up initially There's when there's no configuration present. Uh, it always assumes the faults and not the current system configuration. So if you want to skip it at any time, you can use enter. If you need to do get out of it, you can do control C to finish all the dialogues and then ask you basically if you want to can if you want to enter the basic configuration dial yes or no uh, you can say yes it's going to ask you if you want to enforce password secure password standard for all the other accounts uh, do you want another do you want to create another login so you have the opportunity if you don't want to have just the admin login if you want to create multiple logins for uh, other administrators you can uh, you can use a script to configure read only SNMP community string if you like you can or read write community string uh, usually that's going to be no. I'm assuming you're all going to want to use SMP version 3 versus just the community string. Uh, you can do the host name of the switch and then you can configure out of the band out of band management. Uh, out of band management requires the special management zero port to be connected to some other device that has network reachability. Uh, you'll end the IPv4 address on that and the mask and whether you need to configure a default gateway to access it if you're going to be accessing it from somewhere off that network. Uh, you'll need to put in the default gateway if it's contained in the single one. If you have a dedicated station, you might be able to get away without doing the default gateway since you're going to be the same to broadcast domain. Uh, you can configure advanced IP options or not. Usually you're going to say no. Uh, telnet service you should never uh, enable. And then it's going to ask you if you want to enable SSH. SSH is going to be the only way that you're going to be able to access the switch through other than the console port at this point. So when you say yes, it's going to ask you what type of key you want to use. The default is RSA or you can use DSA. Uh, you get to choose the key size from anywhere from 1024 to 2048 and whether or not the default interface layer is going to be layer 2 or layer 3. Um, and then you can configure what the default switchboard interface state is going to be. So you're going to have a lot of switchboard interfaces. Say there's, let's say in the 5500, there's 40 interfaces. Uh, by default, you can choose them to be turned on or turned off. Uh, in this case, the default is shut. So uh, for anything that you want to stand up, you're going to have to physically go into the port and turn it on. And then it's going to end by telling you that now it's collected all this information. It's going to configure. It's going to follow. It's going to configure the following settings. It's going to configure password strength check because we said yes. It's going to set the switch name to N7K. It's going to configure the interface management zero with the address of 172.16.120/24, and it's going to turn it on so that you have access to it. It's going to put it in the VRF of context management, and it's going to create a default route to 172.16.11 so that you can access that default management network from off that subnet. Uh, it's going to tell Telnet to not be config configured. It's a feature that's by default. It's going to turn it off no matter what. And then it's going to set up your SSH key with the RSA and turn the feature SSH on. Um, it's going to do no system default switch port so that they're all going to be, and it's going to set them all and turn to be shut down. And that's going to ask you if you'd like to edit it or not. So it gives you a brief overview of what you've set, gives you the opportunity to say, no, I messed it up. I'd like to go through it again. Or you say no, and then you get the opportunity to save it. At that point, you can reboot the switch, and it's going to come up with your management plane ready to go for you to configure. And that's the end of today's uh, syllabus. Uh, are there any questions? Nope, we uh, we got them all uh, in line. So thank you. All right, great. And uh, thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. Uh, we'll have the recording posted to YouTube and iTunes shortly. And uh, come back next week, and we'll have uh, Shane again. Thanks again uh, for tonight, Shane. No problem. Thank you very much. Right. Have a good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Right,